Oh, that was a very touching introduction. Thank you, Tom. This really is, you know, I, I do think that everything happens for a reason, and it is a crazy but fortuitous day for me. It truly is a full circle moment. I was literally in your seat um, not just 20 years ago, but even last week. So I, um, I, I have a huge appreciation for the power of this speaker series, and it really is an honor to participate in it. Um, before I give my talk, uh, two quick caveats. The first is, is that today we're going to be talking about building venture scalable businesses or billion dollar businesses. And I want to say that that is just one slice of entrepreneurship. Um, it is an important slice, but it is a narrow slice. And I want to caveat this by saying that your first job, if you feel the calling of entrepreneurship, is to reflect within about what is authentically right for you and then to curry the resources, talent, and capital to get your mission to be realized. And if that can align with the venture-backed model, you can do amazing things. But every um, company and every venture is different. And the second thing I just want to say is, is that my intention here is to really distill the nuggets of insight that I've collected along the way over the 20 years since I was in your seat as a Stanford student, and to share those nuggets. And every now and then, you'll pick out pick a nugget of insight that will come to you in life to try to distill those for you, for anybody who's going down this path. And my defining professional work experience was in venture capital. And so that is why this talk is going to be about building billion dollar businesses. Okay, So we're going to be talking about building these grand scale types of businesses. Okay, And so with that, um, let me first give a f uh, some further details about who I am. Um, Tom's introduction was fantastic. I, as, uh, as I said, I graduated from Stanford with a bachelor's in engineering and a master's in industrial engineering. Um, when I was at Stanford, one of my hallmark experiences was as a Mayfield fellow, and I worked at a comp as, a, at a, as an intern at a startup called Extensity that went public. I then worked at McKinsey in San Francisco, and then at another startup with other Mayfield fellows called Zaplet that raised $100 million in venture capital, but then ultimately failed. Um, but my canonical work experience was as a venture capitalist at DFJ in Menlo Park. So at DFJ, we funded, and I got to see companies grow like Skype, Tesla, Baidu, SpaceX. Um, so some phenomenal companies from the sidelines. The one company that I championed when I was at DFJ was a company called Justin TV, which Draper Associates led an investment into. That became Twitch. That, get, that was acquired for just shy of a billion dollars by Amazon. So that was my first unicorn experience. And then DFJ became the anchor investor in the accelerator that I now run called Alchemist. So Alchemist is backed by a bunch of VCs and other reputable institutions. And we um, write small checks into a lot of companies a year. We give typically $36,000 to 70 startups a year. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be rated the top accelerator in 2016 by CB Insights based on how much money our companies raised. And we generally are viewed as one of the top overall accelerators. We focus on any startups that monetize from enterprises. And I mention that because we have seen the model of building startups on that venture back path. We've had 137 companies close capital. They've raised almost a billion dollars. And we've had 34 acquisitions. And these are some of our graduates. Um, some of whom have also been ETL speakers in the class. But we have many companies that are emerging out of Alchemist that have literally raised over $100 million in capital and that are on that path of becoming a billion dollar or unicorn based startup. And so with that, that is the ex ex experience that I have to inform the talk today. And the first thing that I want to, you guys to understand is you know, in good, when, whenever we teach the spirit of entrepreneurship, we start from within, but then we also teach good classic customer development and design thinking. Um, and when you're starting that, when you're looking at these models, I want you to also understand the incentives and the motivations of, of the, in, the venture capitalists that are providing the fuel that drives this specific type of entrepreneurship. Um, and it is a very powerful type of entrepreneur. I think this is a slide that I also, when I was at Stanford, that, we, that, that I remember Tom was, was, uh, would use. But this, the, the industry, venture capital, is a powerhouse of an industry. It's just 0.2% of our GDP. And it's responsible for creating companies that are responsible for over a fifth of the economy. So it is a powerhouse of an industry. But it's a very idiosyncratic industry, because literally of the 10,000 startups that get produced a year, only 10 
are responsible for 97% of the returns. And so if you, if you grok that further, as a venture capitalist, if you are, have a fund, it is very difficult for that fund to economically survive unless that fund is able to back companies that become worth a billion dollars. And these are famously called, from former ETL speaker Eileen Lee, unicorns. Um, I, I love that name, but also there's an issue with that name because they aren't fictitious. They actually exist. And part of our intention with this class is to demystify these unicorns as being real people who have flaws just like everybody else but build big companies. And part of what I want to do today is just to unlock some of the hidden dynamics of how to build these billion dollar unicorns. But if you, if you are a venture capitalist and you have a billion dollar fund, you're getting that money from others and your job is to pay that money back. Okay, so if you think about that, if your goal is to pay back a billion dollars, um, that means, and if you assume that a venture capital fund can own 20% of a company, and you know, if, you, if they own too much, it creates incentives problems with the entrepreneurs. That means to pay back a billion dollars, you need to have five companies in your portfolio that become worth a billion dollars. Does that make sense? And that's just to pay back the fund 1x. To pay back the fund three times to make money, you have to have 15 unicorns. And, and so returning a fund can be like capture, capturing, uh, um, catching lightning in a bottle. And, um, and, and the big issue is, is that historically, there's only around 25 companies that get created every year that become worth even at least just half a billion or above. Okay? And so that is the nut of trying to figure out how to crack the venture capital industries. As a venture capitalist, in some senses, you are a unicorn hunter. If you do not fund a company that becomes worth that amount, it is very difficult if you have a certain fund of a certain size to stay economically viable. Okay? And so with that, we're going to talk today about are there any secrets around building companies that become worth a billion dollars or building these venture scalable businesses. And the key insight here really is, comes, is distilled down from the Archimedes quote. You know, Archimedes famously said that if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, I can move the earth. And the, the notion there is, is that if you architect a system in the right way, for the same amount of effort, you can have a disproportionate return. You know, former ETL speaker Ben Horowitz, who's a, a famous venture capitalist at Andreessen Horowitz, he said this, I think, in another way, where he basically says, it takes as much work to start a mediocre business as it does to start a big business, so you might as well go big. You know, I can assure you that if you are not succeeding as an entrepreneur, you're not working any less. Okay? You're working as hard, if not harder. Um, to get by. So if you're going to go down the path of entrepreneurship, you will be working hard. And if you're going to be working hard and you have a mission that you care about, part of the beauty of the opportunity that exists if you do align with venture capital is, is that if you go big, in some ways more resources can be thrown at you to solve that problem. And so right now then what I want to discuss is how, what, are the, what is the architecture that you can do to sort of invoke that Archimedes principle to create these disproportionate returns. And the key insight here is to go from zero to hero, you need to walk exponentially as opposed to linearly. So we all know the difference between linear and exponential. This is Stanford, I know. This is Silicon Valley. But if I'm walking linearly, it's just one, two, three, four, right? If I walk exponentially, it's one, Two, four, eight, sixteen. Okay, and you know if you're going from a million dollar valuation today to a billion dollar valuation in ten years, what that means is that you need to grow a thousand x in ten years. To grow a thousand x in ten years, that means you need to grow ten x three times. Does that make sense? So ten x every three years. To grow ten x every three years, you need to triple every year and a half, or double roughly every twelve months. I know it's basic math, but just, just grokking that or just internalizing that will make a lot of other things clear about how the dynamics of Silicon Valley work. Um, and so just to make this graphical, this is the growth of the internet um, from the 60s to the 2000s. Okay? And it looks fairly linear, but it's posted on a logarithmic scale. But if you're the internet, it looks like things just grew at a normal pace. You know, they just grew linearly. But if I shift that scale from a logarithmic scale to a linear scale, 
that same data looks like this. And suddenly it looks like something drastic happened in the late 90s. There was a knee in the curve and everything suddenly changed. But the reality was, was that the internet, the dynamics of how the internet was growing was steady. It was just architected in a way to grow multiplicatively. And we, who experienced the world linearly, felt it as this big shift that happened in the late 90s. And so uh, we've already sort of gone over the math of this. But basically, we need to sort of double every year to get to that billion dollar outcome in 10 years. Or if you want to do it in a shorter period of time, you have to grow even quicker. Okay? Um, and we all understood, I think, the difference between different growth rates. So now then the question becomes, so Ravi, what are these architects or, 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 or these mechanisms, these drivers to architect something for multiplicative growth? And the, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about a few. But the overriding principle that I want you to understand is thinking about how you set things up so that there's positive reinforcement loops, um, so that every action you take has a multiplicative effect and not just a linear effect, so that the output is not a linear function of the input, but is a multiplicative um, output. Um, and so let me make this clear. So we're going to start with the first, a first driver, which is just simply gross margins. Um, Gross margins is just the revenue minus the, co the gross costs of producing an item. So let's say that I am selling a cookie, okay, and it costs me 50 cents to make a cookie. And I know all those ETL students are really hungry after they hear those lectures. And so I camp out outside of um, class, outside of Huang, and I, my intention is to sell you a cookie. And if I sell you that cookie for a dollar, okay, my gross margins are 50 cents. I sell you the cookie for a dollar, it costs me 50 cents to make. I make 50 cents of profit, which means that how many cookies can I make next? One cookie. Okay? I sell that other cookie for a dollar, I make 50 cents of profit, and I can make one more cookie. So at 50 cents, or a 50% margin, my slope is zero. Does that make sense? I am basically just making one cookie every, every cycle. Okay. If I have the insight to say, you know what, I'm not going to target the Stanford students. I'm going to go to the faculty club. They, that's where they have the money. And I'm going to charge a buck fifty for that, for that cookie. Suddenly, just by shifting the price up to $1.50, my margins go from 50% to 67%. But I sell that cookie for $1.50 at the faculty club. It costs me 50 cents to make. I make a dollar of profit, which means how many cookies can I make? I can make two cookies. Okay. And if I sell both of those two cookies for $1.50 each, it's $3. It costs me a dollar to make. I have $2 in profit, which means I can make four cookies. Okay? So just by doing that subtle shift of having the gross margins go from 50% to 67%, I'm suddenly on a multiplicative path. Okay? Does that make sense? And at 75, and let's say if you know what, if you're like, you know, it's not the faculty club, it's the Stanford Mall. That's where the real money is. All the venture capitalists go and they shop there. I'm going to go to the Stanford Mall and sell that cookie for $2. Um, and it only cost me 50 cents. Suddenly, I make 75% margins, or a buck 50. I sell one cookie for 50 cents for $2. I make $1.50 of profit. I can then produce three cookies. If I sell those three cookies for um, uh, $2 each, that's $6. It cost me $2. I make $4 of profit. And then I keep going up. Okay? And so 75% then gets us at this, at this magic growth clip of 3x. I can start growing 3x um, at 75%. And so one of the golden rules, by the way, is, is that if you do not want to raise venture capital, but you're like, I do want to build a billion dollar business, if you can have your margins be 75% or higher, and if you can bill up front, if you can have people pay you before you have to build the product, so if you can have people prepay for a year of Spotify before you deliver the service, or prepay for a magazine, then you can be customer funded and put yourself on that 3x growth curve to, 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 to keep hitting things. Okay? This is why venture capitalists love software, because the costs, as, as we increase these margins, our growth rates become even more absurd. And if you think about with, with software, the, the cost of doing a Google search, the, 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 the gross costs are just the energy of that server. It's basically infinite, it's basically nothing. Um, and this is why VCs hate hardware. I mean, just to oversimplify, I don't want to speak for all of venture capitalists, but hardware requires capital. You know, you have to put in money. Your gross margins are lower. You need to worry about distribution and all these other things. 
Okay? And so these are some questions that I would ask if I was a venture capitalist and that I would also want to arm you to understand if you're a founder building a business that's seeking venture capital or, or just trying to build a big business is understand what your gross margins are. If you're building hardware, understand what your bill of materials are. And if you are building something that's going to be hardware-like, then you need to be able to answer the question of how do you finance the business to cover your cost of goods. And that's a separate discussion that we can have later. Does that make sense? So that's lesson one is gross margins. The next thing that I think is a source, and these are just sources of multiplicative growth, of exponential growth. They exist everywhere. Everywhere you see these positive reinforcing loops where the input can lead to an, a multiplicative output, pay attention. Um, but the other thing is technology. And this is why uh, investors love to fund companies that are built on new tech, because tech is inherently exponential in how it grows. This is the classic Kurzweil graph on Moore's Law. And I know we have a sophisticated audience here. Um, Moore's Law is just this notion that the density of, trans of, transi of, of transistors doubles every year and a half for um, the same price point effectively. You, everybody knows this experientially when you go and you buy your next smartphone. It seems like it can do everything uh, uh, so much more than it could a year and a half ago. Um, and that, this, this trend has held tr true since the early 1900s. The technology grows naturally on a multiplicative curve because the outputs of technology are the, become the inputs to drive the next generation of technology. We use the Intel chips to build the computers that design the next Intel chips, if that makes sense. So the outputs become the inputs, and it, it naturally um, has an exponential curve. You see this all over technology. This is the growth of the internet, which we had before, which is doubling every 12 months. Um, this is magnetic data storage, which doubles every 15 months. Um, but the core essence here is, is that technology is an invitation. It's an opportunity to, take, to really enter into a market with a weapon that might be creating a new opportunity that you didn't have before. And so I would say, actually, the essential question that venture capitalists are looking for, especially what I've seen from the top tier venture capitalists, is answering the question of why now? Um, what technologically exists now in your business that didn't exist before that allows your business to, um, to succeed? And, and so the essence of that is, you know, why couldn't this business have been done three years ago? And you should have a, an answer to that. If it technologically could have been done three years ago or five years ago, it's very hard oftentimes for somebody to believe that just no one of the other six billion people in the world just didn't have the idea. What's more likely is that somebody tried the idea and it failed for, a re for other reasons. But if there was a technological reason why your business couldn't have existed before, then that is credible. Then, then it sort of makes sense that nobody could have, uh, could have done it until now. So answering that why now question is a very powerful one um, for both VCs and entrepreneurs. And again, you know, we talk about exponential curves, but really exponential curves are just what we call S-curves, where you're, you're having some technology that then becomes more mainstream and then it gets replaced by another S-curve, and the cascading of those becomes this exponential curve. So a couple questions, then, um, that you should think about if you're a founder or that you might be, be ready to be asked if you go and present in front of an investor, is if you are going to argue that you're riding on some new technology or you're developing a core new technology as part of your offering, they'll be prepared to answer, is this technology advantage 10x better than the alternative. The reason why investors will ask you for 10x is because just secularly with Moore's Law, everything doubles every 18 months. So at least with the 10x advantage, you have three 18-month doubling periods of a buffer, or around four years you know, of, a, of, of a buffer. If you have less than 10x, the world is going to catch up to you anyways. So, so think about if it's something significant. The other questions that I would ask is that if I was a customer and I was going to evaluate you, what metrics would I use to assess you versus the alternatives, and how would you fare on those? And if, it's, and if the advantage is something algorithmic, think about what the trade-off is. Are you sacrificing speed for um, quality or something else? It, you don't also need to do it something that is just purely technological. You know, the iPhone was really the birthplace of so many great companies like Uber, Spotify, Instagram that technically really weren't building the core disruption. They were riding on the wave of the iPhone. And that also is a fantastic, because if you can ride an existing platform that is newly existing, that just came, that just came out, that also can create huge um, benefits and be well received. 
But then just be prepared to answer why you're going to out-execute everybody else. And you can say, hey, we're using this new technology platform, but we're going to out-execute everybody else for, for these reasons. I would say that this is, it's going to be a very fun time if you, um, to be a, a entrepreneur right now because, um, because of the acceleration of Moore's Law and because of how quick technology is expanding, we are going to see um, 20,000 years of historical progress is going to be the equivalent of what's going to happen in the next 100 years or in, the, in, in this century. So if you just extrapolate Moore's Law going forward, there are some intimidatingly um, amazing implications. The first is, is that you know, we achieve the capability of a human brain for about $1,000 by the time most of you, by the 2023, when most of you, I guess, will be um, 21 in this, in this class. When you guys, when, you know, if you're a Stanford student today, by the time you're 37, we'll have the capability of a human brain for um, a penny. And by the time you're in your late 40s, we'll have the human race's capability for $1,000. And by the time you're in your 50s, it'll be the whole human race for a penny. And so if you can grok your mind to think exponentially, to think about where the puck is headed, and resist our natural tendency to extrapolate the future from the linear past, there's so many opportunities. There's so much power in democratized, commoditized technology to take on all the you know, uh, very, very deep, deep problems that the world is facing. So that's technology as a source of multiplicative growth. And the final one, and I, I do want to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A. So the, uh, you know, a final one to touch upon, I would say, is network effects, which I know is sort of a buzzy term that everybody talks about these days. Um, but everybody understands what a network effect is. A network effect is something where a product becomes more valuable as it scales its users. So as the volume of a product, which is an amazing thing. So usually, as you scale volume, quality suffers. You know, as you get bigger, you worry that you're going to be delivering less quality. But if you build a business that has network effects, the opposite holds true. As you get bigger, you deliver more value. The classic example of this is Skype or um, WhatsApp or any communication tool. So if, um, if, if there is only, um, if I tell everybody right now that, hey, I just built Ruvy app. It's exactly like WhatsApp. It's technically identical. Everybody should use it. Um, nobody's going to join Ruvy app, even though I'm technically identical to WhatsApp, because the network is on WhatsApp. And the value is the network. Um, so, or if, for example, with Skype, if there is only one person on Skype, um, how many, you can make zero calls. If there's two people, you can make one call. If there's three, you can make three. If there's four, you can make six. Um, every extra node that gets added to the network increases the number of connections, and that's generally referred to as Metcalfe's Law, where the value of, 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 a, of a communication platform is a proxy to the square of the nodes. Okay? And so that's why communication-driven platforms like Skype or WhatsApp can be incredibly powerful. Um, others have calculated the value not just as the square of the nodes, but also as, a, as a, an exponential, as a 2 to the n, um, uh, value based on the permutations of the subgroups. So if you look at the value of Facebook based on all the multitude of, 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 of subgroups get, that can emerge, you get an even greater, ant, a greater response. But the idea here is, is that if you build a business with network effects, every single additional node creates more value for each individual user. And just to show you how powerful this is, if you look at Facebook, this is Facebook, and it is impressive how quickly Facebook grew. So Facebook grew at an impressive rate. And that is the red line that you see there um, at, at the bottom. But what's even more impressive is the green dots are their revenue. And, and the line next to the green dots is a proxy of Metcalfe's law, that, you know, that exponential growth that we were showing. So as impressive as their user growth was, what was even more impressive was that their revenue was growing exponentially because of the network effects that are inherent in a social network. To juxtapose that, there's other great companies that are a great phenomenon. This is Angry Birds. You guys know Angry Birds, right? Angry Birds is a um, single player mode game phenomenon. So if I'm playing Angry Birds, that does not increase the value of your Angry Birds experience. Um, it is your, your Angry Birds experience does not increase with the volume of the users. 
Um, and so Angry Birds was amazing, but it was completely linear in terms of its revenue was just a function of how many people downloaded it. It didn't become more valuable at scale. Okay? So thinking about how you can build businesses with network effects can also be very powerful. And these, again, occur really whenever there's a positive feedback loop. That can be communication, like Skype or WhatsApp or any social network that we've talked about. It can be a marketplace. So you know, um, Craigslist or eBay are, 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 are classic examples of really hard businesses to displace, even though the technology is very, very basic, because there's liquidity of buyers and sellers together on this common marketplace. Um, or it can be a platform, like uh, the Apple operating system, where um, developers are building on top of every developer that adds to Apple's operating system extends the functionality of the operating system, which then also creates more value for, valuable value for everybody that's involved. And so there's a, a type of marketplace that happens with platforms. It's no, but, and, and I should say, you know, I was sort of speaking disparagingly about hardware a few minutes ago. Okay? And you might say, you know, if hardware is so, so bad, why do you have all these beautiful software businesses like Google um, that spent $3.2 billion on Nest, which is a hardware device for the home, or Facebook, which spent over $2 billion for Oculus, which is these hardware devices? Why is hardware so um, disparaged if, in fact, these, these beautiful software business models are spending a lot of money for them? And I would argue it's because Facebook you know, is buying Oculus because they don't want to be beholden to Apple, which is the hardware platform that they are underneath. Because every time somebody downloads a Facebook app for your iPhone, that becomes another user that another platform can use for, 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 for themselves. So they may lose um, Facebook users to, to other platforms uh, that they're trying to compete with. And so ultimately, they're beholden to the underlying platform, which is what they want to own. So I would argue that's why they went out to buy. So, so the saving grace here is, is what I want to say is, is that these platforms or network effects can be incredibly powerful. And they can override even many of the other things that I was discussing before. And it's no coincidence then that you know, the, the four of the tech companies that became worth a trillion dollars all have network effects at play. Amazon's one of the biggest marketplaces. Apple has an operating system. It has um, communication-driven uh, tools and marketplaces. All of these um, um, uh, uh, exist because um, it, for a reason. And there's a reason why that drove such huge, huge growth. But I also want to say that there's a bunch of, so these are some of the questions that you should be ready to answer if you are a founder and you're, uh, uh, you're, you're seeking a venture capitalist who's trying to rule you in or out as a unicorn. They may ask a question of, you know, let's say you convince them that your idea is a good idea. They'll say, well, if you prove out your market, if you prove out that what you're doing is great, and a competitor creates a feature identical ripoff of your product, why would a new customer still choose you? And really what they're asking is, are, do you have any network effects? You know, just like nobody would use Ruby app, even if it's technically identical, because it's not about the technology, it's about the network. They're asking, is there a long-term differentiation that you have besides just the short-term differentiation? They may ask, do you view your offering as a product or a platform? And again, the platform is, is there strategic value in the customer beyond just the initial service you provide? And you know, think about if, you're, if you want to focus on monetization, engagement, or growth. If you're building something that has network effects, it may be important to focus on the long-term game of growth or engagement um, first. I want to end, though, by with, 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 with a note about, you know, there, there are a lot of companies that have network effects that don't become a trillion dollar company. Or, or, you know, I think we're going to be ending. We, were, we started talking about billion dollar businesses. Let me now end by talking about trillion dollar businesses, OK? So we had those four examples, uh, Apple, um, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, or Alphabet, that are now trillion dollar companies. And there are a lot of companies that, that have, you know, there are a lot of companies that have a lot of smart minds that can learn all, everything that I'm saying and hire the best, smartest minds and don't become trillion dollar companies. And I think one thing that's hard to argue with is, is that all four of those companies, not, besides just having and going after network effects, they all, and this is informed from a piece of a deeper analysis that Jeff Moore did about five years ago on Apple and Amazon, but they, um, all four of those companies had founders at the helm um, as CEOs when they were publicly traded companies for a long period of time. And 
I think that is not a coincidence, okay? Because there is something about a founder that has the earned authority of its employees and, and its constituents and its stakeholders that can move companies in directions that even the smartest minds can't. And there's something about the founder experience of starting from zero to one, where you go through your own journey of getting knocked down and knowing who you are um, and being able to actually get in touch with that core in, inviolable spirit that exists in bad times or good. And this is sort of a, a time of reflection. It's sort of a time of really getting actually in, in, in touch with that spirit that becomes an indomitable power even when you become famous and big. And really, these companies aren't just companies. These are companies that build other companies. And, 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 and I think that's, you know, if you think about how Apple has moved from a desktop company to all these, becoming the biggest music company, the biggest phone company, now the biggest payments company, or how Amazon went from an online bookstore to the biggest utility cloud computing company, now the biggest home AI company, um, that is not a simple, linear, academic map. There is something else going on. And what I want you to understand is that the essence of all of this, there is an entrepreneur behind these great, big, fictitious, seeming companies that are unicorns or trillion corns, okay, that, um, that is the indomitable spirit that is impossible to replicate or copy. And so really the lesson that I would have for you today is to get in touch with what that means for you because you, um, anybody can copy your technology, nobody can copy you. And so don't worry about trying to be somebody else, just get in touch with what your best self is and then curry the resources around you to have that vision be realized. And all of you founders are heroes in that, in that sense. So thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes, um, so I just wanna make sure that we had enough time for, for questions. And thank you all for participating on this very special and interesting day. So I, we will open it up for questions. This is like entrepreneurship, no risk, no reward. You have to raise your hand to ask questions. Yes, back there. Um, so I was wondering, you were talking about how Moore's Law well might you know, shape, shape uh, return exponential growth in the next century. But there are some people who think Moore's Law is slowing down because we're getting like transistor size, you're getting too small. So do you think that we're still going to be able to maintain that same pace of innovation, innovation without like quantum computing? Yes, this is a great question. So the question is, I was saying that Moore's Law looks like it's, it's, it's going to keep continuing, but there's a lot of people that are arguing that Moore's Law is going to hit its limits because of a variety of reasons, including the heat density of transistors hitting certain physical limits and so forth. I think that's actually a good example of the S-curves um, cascading. So Moore's Law is that exponential curve. And if you notice that example that I showed of Moore's Law starting back in the early 1900s, th those weren't electric transistors in the early 1900s. Those were sometimes physical gates that were the original switches. And I do think that transistors, as semiconductor transistors as we know it, may hit physical limits. But I think there'll be a new paradigm that may replace those. So whether that's quantum computing or some other variant that will um, allow us to shift that thing forward, I do think that there, that is what historically has held true. So in my opinion, it's not, it's, it, it, I wouldn't conflate Moore's Law with transistors. Transistors is one technology S-curve, and Moore's Law is a cascading of S-curves that move over time. Question? Oh, I'm going to call on sorry, Tina Selig. I'm very honored to have Tina here. Right. Tina. Right. Um, I'm curious, does an astounding entrepreneur need to have all of those things in place at the beginning? when they're conceptualizing their company, or are these things that can evolve over time? So the question from Tina is, does a founding entrepreneur need to have all these things in place when they're starting their company, or is this something that can evolve over time? Um, the, you do not need to have all of these things when you are starting a company. So the, the, I think the irony of, of the path of, entrepreneur, of entrepreneurship is, is that it is this bifocal exercise where um, in the beginning, probably the most important thing is is, um, is, is, is focusing, the, 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 there's, um, it, I, I think the hardest thing when you're starting out as an entrepreneur is that the worst decision can sometimes be indecision. Most of the decisions are gonna be very gray and blurred, and if you overwhelm yourself with too many things, it can be paralyzing. And so I do think that Tina's question, and underneath that, is a good lesson, which is I don't want this to cripple or paralyze 
the entrepreneurial spirit. When you're beginning, the key thing I think is to find something to like and to start liking it. It's like find some observation that can come from a variety of places. It can come from people, it can come from the market, it can come from a trend, and start to just apply a curious, a curious mind to unearth what's going on there and have that dance between you and it to tell you what needs to happen. This then becomes a toolkit, I would say, to help you reality test certain things. So if there is a way that any of these things can be applied, it can help support that growth. So even just on gross margins, if you can collect your cash up front versus later, that can have a profound just tactical um, impact on your business, but it's not the essence of entrepreneurship. These are just um, helpful adjustments effectively on the path. Thanks, Tina. Yes. I love Teslas, but when I look at all your criteria, when you funded it, what made you fund it? Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, I love Tesla, but if you look at all of my criteria, um, why, would, why would you fund it? And so Tesla, I would say, and even SpaceX, which DFJ funded, and I do need to say that it, a, a lot of that is a testament to Steve Jurvetson's genius, um, who is the venture capitalist who championed those investments at DFJ. Um, but that's sort of the classic thing that you would learn in business school not to fund, um, because for all the reasons why you, you said. It's, it's hardware, it's capital intensive. With SpaceX, it can literally blow up. <laughs> so why would you fund that? And I think the idea here is, is that really the genius of Elon Musk is, is that what you see as a car is not a car. And what you see as a rocket is actually not a rocket. Um, and it's a question of shifting your, 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 your viewpoint of what that is. If you view Tesla as a car company, it is not something that you would normally fund. But if you view it really as an autonomous software platform and, that's a, data and a data gatherer, and a, yeah, exactly, um, that is using this physical instrument of a car to do that, it becomes a totally different um, opportunity and company. Do you see it exponentially? Yes, I do. I think anybody who has a Tesla probably sees that as well. Um, I think it's because it's, a Tesla is not a car company. I think it is more, in my view, it is a profound um, data gatherer and, and operating system yeah, that gets put. Oh, so the, so the question is the revenues are linear. So there's a, so, um, the, uh, uh, so I don't want to go into um, too, many, too, too, too many details around this, but there is a difference between what's called willingness to pay and actual monetization. And you know, I think this goes back to this question of, uh, well, how do you think about the balance between monetization and growth and engagement? And sometimes if you, try to, if, you, uh, if you try to focus on monetization at the wrong time, you can win the battle but lose the war. And I think there might be some of that going on when, with Tesla's considerations on things. Yes, in the back. Hi, so thank you so much for your talk. It was really inspiring to me. I, I guess my question is that a lot of times in like the startup culture and in you know, the value you hear about, the idea that you don't necessarily have to be the first mover in the market, and you can just take an existing idea and execute it far better. And so as you know, a seasoned VC, and as someone who really has been entrenched in this industry for a while, can you talk a little bit more about what your thoughts are on that idea? Yeah, so the question is, there's this notion that you don't necessarily have to be the first mover. Um, if, if there's another idea, if you can be a, effectively a fast follower, um, that can also be a path to success, and, some, and perhaps it might be um, even better. And there is this saying that trailblazers carry arrows in their back. Um, and, 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 and so um, I, I do think that, I, I think the, the, I do think there's mul a multi a, a multiple different types of companies if you're looking at it just purely from a financial lens that can become successes. But I do think it's important to understand what your strategy is going to be. So if you are a fast follower, um, I think you want to be very explicit about why, what you have to believe to believe that you're going to win, and what are the lessons that you can take and learn, and then what are the lessons that you're going to do to extend your competitive differentiation. So there's lots of examples of big companies that weren't the first. Google wasn't the first search engine. It was, you know, I think at the time there was over a dozen well-funded search engines. Um, there was a company called Friendster before, before Facebook. Um, that was funded by many of the top funds. And so a lot of the canonical companies that we look at today actually weren't the first. Um, and I do think there is some virtue in seeing, there is some virtue in, in understanding timing, where if you see that a phenomena is emerging, usually from a venture perspective, competition is validation, not something that rules you out. So 
when if 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 when a venture capitalist will often ask, ask you who who are the competitors, who are the alternatives, if there is a space that is an opening from a financial perspective, there's usually going to be three companies that will become significant winners. One will usually go public, um, but be unacquirable, and then the other two will oftentimes get acquired by the existing incumbents that are trying to keep their um, uh, power position. So. I do think the important thing is to identify if there's an if there's a broader market opportunity, and then to think about if it's something that you really want to care about. Because there is the battle of getting table stakes with whoever the front runner is, but that's not going to win the war. What's going to win the war is building something that's a long-term um, uh, viable concern. And that has to come from something more than just trying to copy somebody, but really trying to extend where they're at. But I do think it can be a very effective strategy. You just have to be very focused on what you need to get done to displace them. Yes. So investments, as you've noted, aren't necessarily a hockey stick up or down. Um, can you talk a little bit about your involvement as in, you know, a unicorn? If, you know, it has its bumps in the road, it's going up, and, you know, ultimately if an investment doesn't work out, how you've kind of chosen to step away, any measures you've taken in between? Okay. Yes. Happy to. So the question is, can you talk about um, my involvement as when, I'm, when we're backing unicorns, just how that progression occurs, especially if there are speed bumps around the way, or even worse, if there's um, things that retreat backwards. You know, the interesting thing is, is that if you fund a company that becomes a, a unicorn, oftentimes there are companies that are, become these phenomena that require the least amount of work sometimes, because they just, you're, you're in these moments of time and space where things just become, they, they, they grow phenomenally quickly. And in those moments, um, Sometimes the, the, the bigger issues are around helping the companies or thinking about how the companies are going to scale. But as a venture capitalist, oftentimes when you're needed the most is when the companies are in moments of crisis. Um, and so the irony here is that sometimes the companies that grow the quickest need the least amount of help. And then usually you get called in and consumed when there's some, something critically going around. The, the, the caveat to that I would say is um, on strategic transactions, that's where your investors are um, can be incredibly critical. So I can assure, I can tell you that the strategic transaction of, of Twitch's a, um, acquisition by Amazon, um, that was a very, and, that, and, and I'm not saying that that was me at all, but that was a very important strategic um, um, transaction to get that right. And at those moments, a very helpful board can be very, very critical. Um, and, and, and honestly, a lot of your time is spent when there are those speed bumps, and they happen in so many ways. Um, uh, many times that what happens is, is understanding how the companies are shifting and going through different phases where the thing that you were prioritizing before is not the thing that you need to prioritize in this next phase. So if you were prioritizing growth before, now you have to shift to monetization or, or from engagement to growth. Understanding those inflection points, I think, is where a helpful board member can really be involved in shifting the company. And then in, 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 in very specific strategic transactions, sourcing talent, um, partnerships, acquisitions, things like that. That is time. I apologize. I know that I, I went a little bit over, but um, thank you all. This is, a, this, is, this is the end of this season of the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar. Thank you guys all for participating, and we look forward to having you back next season.